Hello and welcome to Social Studies 2201, Unit 4, Modern Economic Change. In this outcome, we'll look at some major economic changes that occurred in the modern era. In 11.1, we'll look at factors that led to the rise of capitalism. 11.2, we'll explain how industrialism changed the economy during the late modern era. And in 11.3, we'll explain the factors that led to the rise of socialism. So we'll start with 11.1, development of capitalism. So if we want to understand where capitalism came from, uh, we should think back to what we last learned about mercantilism. Uh, this was a dominant system of um, trade and economic policy that existed um, uh, before the 1750s, we'll say. Uh, and in it, government controlled the economy pretty heavily. Um, they taxed uh, goods coming into their countries. Uh, they put trade restrictions um, for other <laughs> nations. Uh, and other merchants from foreign areas uh, in place uh, to restrict the benefits that foreigners would receive from trade. Um, they believed that wealth was finite and could be collected through acquisition of new territories. So um, they more or less viewed wealth as a, a pie. Um, there's only so much of it, and their goal was to collect uh, as many pieces of the pie as possible. Uh, this system drove uh, a quest for colonies um, through dominance of other territories, um, which would, of course, have a major effect um, on not just Europe, but uh, other regions of the world. Uh, it increased wealth for the privileged in European nations. Okay, so those merchants who could benefit from this and those who um, funded and were a part of joint stock companies uh, saw a great benefit from this new economic system. Um, but the average person still remained fairly poor and lived uh, an agrarian lifestyle, we'll say, um, based on uh, farming, um, craftsmanship, and so on. Mercantilism also magnified the slave trade, uh, which had existed uh, ever since uh, civilization um, thousands of years earlier um, but this system of dominating other territories uh, and trying to uh, maintain a positive balance of trade through lowering expenses uh, contributed to um, a boost in the slave trade as a form of uh, very 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 cheap labor um, and it inspired, inspired nations to build up navies for conquest and protection of colonies. Uh, in addition to this, you'd have trade fleets um, with uh, trading vessels that could uh, ship goods back and forth. So the question is, who would be opposed to a system like this? Um, certainly it would not be the wealthy, uh, especially the wealthy members or, or uh shareholders in joint stock companies, um, anyone who couldn't benefit um, to a significant degree would probably have some issue with this system. Let's look at a couple of the major criticisms of mercantilism. The first one is that trade restrictions hurt many merchants and companies. If you remember last time we were talking about mercantilism, at the end of uh, outcome 10, it's really only um, certain companies, certain joint stock companies that received charters from governments that granted monopolies that were able to properly benefit uh, from this system. They were essentially given the right, the exclusive right to trade within um, certain regions uh, for certain goods and products. So if you were not a member of that joint stock company, uh, or you're a, a smaller local merchant, 
you would likely have issues uh, with mercantilism because you weren't able to benefit to the same degree as others who you might say uh, had an unfair advantage. Number two, high tariffs uh, hurt international trade. A tariff is a tax on an imported foreign product. So the idea is, is that if you produce your own goods, um, you don't want people from other uh, countries or regions uh, underselling you because they can produce those goods at a cheaper price um, or cheaper expense and therefore sell them to you uh, or your people in your country at a lower, cheaper price. Uh, so you would put a tariff on those foreign products, which basically means that uh, their cost would be much more expensive. So people would likely buy your cheaper locally made products instead. Um, so that's the idea behind tariffs. But the more tariffs that you have, it restricts trade with other countries. So merchants who um, are involved in particular goods uh, and along particular trade routes would have an issue with government um, placing these restrictions on them and their business, therefore, they're, thereby limiting the amount of profit that they can uh, gain. So both these criticisms are due to the fact that government controlled how trade and the economy was run. Okay, so government puts laws in place to determine what companies could operate in a given region uh, and what goods can be traded. They also put tariffs and other restrictions on um, goods coming in from other countries. So really what this does is it gives government the control over um, uh, over, over the economy, essentially. And other uh, members uh, of the economic community would have to sort of fall in, into place or fall in line with that system. So the question is, what would help change this to meet uh, the needs of a greater number or and variety of business people? Well, the basic idea is, as we say over here on the side, government keep out. Okay, so some people started to believe uh, that government should have less of a role in the economy. Uh, and the term that became used in the early days um, and in the 1700s to describe this situation uh, is laissez-faire. Okay, it's the idea that the best way to generate wealth uh, in a country is if the government does not intervene, does not intervene or regulate industries and businesses. So basically government keep out of the economy is the idea. Uh, the term is French for let do, as in let industry do what it will or what it must to profit. Um, and supporters of uh, laissez-faire economics argue that heavy tariffs and restrictions hurt the generation of wealth because these um, restrictions would limit the amount of trade that could occur uh, and it would in turn limit the amount of production that would occur. If you can open it up to a wider range of people, goods and production uh, and trade, then it was argued that uh, more wealth could actually be produced. This economic system is based on the idea that wealth is not finite. Mercantilism was about the idea that wealth is like a pie. There's only so much of it, so you have to collect whatever you can. Um, Laissez-faire, when it comes to the economy, is about opening the economy to the point uh, that you can actually produce more wealth than what was around um, beforehand uh, if government uh, limited the restrictions or stayed out of um, the economy. So you might argue then that um, instead of uh, wealth being like a pie that you try to get the most um, or the greatest share of, maybe uh, with fewer restrictions, you can in a sense have more than one pie. You can maybe have many pies and that would create a much wider 
um, variety um, of goods that can be traded, production that could occur, and therefore wealth that can be generated at the end of the day. People who supported laissez-faire economics also advocated for free trade. And this is a big thing that we've heard um, in the news over the last number of decades. Um, and free trade is this just basically this idea of trade without tariffs or restrictions. It's a flow of commerce in world market without government regulation. So really we're looking at um, fewer tariffs or limits or quotas on the amount of trade that can occur. So laissez-faire in this sense is very much uh, becoming almost the opposite of mercantilism in terms of who's controlling the economy and what um, what produces uh, wealth, or the idea of what wealth is and how it can be produced. If we look at where this idea came from and why it gained popularity, uh, we don't have to look much further than uh, Scottish economist Adam Smith, uh, no doubt one of the most brilliant economists uh, in history, actually. Um, he first developed uh, this idea of uh, laissez-faire economics and uh, basically argued for its adoption. Uh, he wrote a number of books on economic and social theory, but uh, his book, The Wealth of Nations, uh, certainly involves economic uh, freedom as being a key theme uh, and, and how governments can... Uh, or countries can develop this type of economic freedom through a laissez-faire type of policy. Uh, and he also argued that if this happened and government reduced its involvement and restrictions and hold over the economy, then it would almost certainly guarantee economic progress in countries. So Smith was one of these people who saw um, a system like mercantilism as being restrictive and very much limiting. There are three main economic laws that uh, Adam Smith developed. And this is basically the main argument for why government should stay out of uh, the economy and economic uh, decisions in terms of trade and production and so on. The first is the law of self-interest. Uh, this basically says that people are self-interested. They're almost to the point of selfish. Um, basically, people will make decisions and do what is best for them. Okay, you will in any situation, you will do what um, should result in the greatest amount of good for you. Okay, so that's law number one. The second law is the law of competition. And this is the idea that if you allow many, many uh, people or companies um, into the economy or in given regions or whatever it might be, then that competition will force people to change the way they make products and how they sell them. So, for example, instead of um, one joint stock company having a total monopoly on the production and sale of uh, T, for example, if other uh, companies were allowed to get involved in the tea trade, then what that would mean is that um, the the first company, the first joint stock company, now has to actually think about how it's producing goods uh, and to try to make sure that they get the greater share of the business possible. So competition would mean that that company now wants to do one of two things. They can either uh, produce a higher quality product that people will buy anyway because it's better, or they have to create efficiencies in their production system so that they can produce a greater number of goods at a low cost. And therefore, that low cost means that they can now sell those goods at a cheaper price and therefore get the majority of business because of cheaper prices. Okay. 
Uh, so that uh, becomes a very, very important part of uh, laissez-faire um, economic policy. Number three, the law of supply and demand or the laws of supply and demand um, say, uh, this says that in a free market economy, prices would fall and rise based on consumer wants and the availability of products and resources uh, to make those products. Uh, and to see exactly what that means, uh, we'll look at um, this in just a little bit more detail. So Smith argued that forces supply and demand in the marketplace would determine economic success. So if there's high demand for products, then um, producers can charge more for them because people really want them and therefore uh, are probably willing to pay more to get the products. Okay, If uh, consumers don't uh, want or need a lot of a product, um, then really the, the point that would make them still consider buying products is the price. Okay, If you don't really need it, um, then if the price is really low, you might say, okay, it's a really good deal on this. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I'll buy it. Okay, It's cheaper than the alternative or, or whatever the case might be. So high demand uh, will result in higher prices because people are willing to uh, pay for it. Low demand results in prices going down so that the producer can actually sell their goods. So if businesses charge too much for a product, people will not want it. And if people really want a product, they will pay more to get it. That's the basic idea. Uh, that's for demand. If we look at supply, uh, this has got to do with the scarcity or, or rarity, I guess, of a product. So if, if there's plentiful supply or uh, a lot of a product or good, then it's easy to come by. You might be able to get it from a variety of sources. So therefore, uh, prices are going to be lower. It's easier to get. Uh, so in order to, to sell a product, you might have to lower your prices. Uh, it's just like the idea of uh, uh, something that's rare or precious having a very high price to it. Scarce supply, uh, just as I mentioned, uh, would, would result in a high price. So if businesses have produced too much of a product, uh, it is no longer rare or highly desired. Okay, um, And in order to um, unload their supply, they would have to sell it at a cheaper price. So this uh, would result in, um, that scenario would result in a benefit for the consumer, of course. So the basic idea with with Smith's um, uh, Smith's laws is that any company uh, would want, as under Law One, uh, would want to uh, do whatever is in its best interest. So if lowering prices to sell a good is in the best interest of that company, then that's what they will do. Um, if it's in their, the best interest of that company to find newer and cheaper resources uh, to produce their products, then that's what they'll do. But it, the idea of uh, self-interest also applies to consumers. People want to be smart with their money. So uh, they will likely spend money in a way that's beneficial to them, as in they won't overspend or they will look for deals. They will try to buy cheaper products. So these ideas uh, will also interact with uh, competition because competition also is an additional force that encourages companies to try to produce at cheaper prices and to be more efficient and therefore lower their expenses and do basically what's in their best interest to get a bigger share of potential trade and the wealth that comes from that. Okay. So basically what... Um, <clears throat> what Smith was arguing is that the government didn't need to be a part of the economy anyway, because these are natural laws or forces that will determine what happens in the economy anyway. 
Okay. So as his ideas became more popular, powerful countries began to put policies and laws in place to allow greater freedom of business. Again, it's a choice that government and, and countries have to make uh, to relax restrictions and so on. So it's not really government against business. That's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is government creating an environment that allows business to prosper uh, and, and grow and develop is essentially what it is. So in order for businesses to be successful, they have to keep the needs and desires of uh, consumers and customers in mind while being efficient in production. So these main points um, certainly will help drive uh, um, you know, competition, uh, their self-interest, and um, certainly supply and demand to meet the needs uh, of both um, consumers, but also businesses. Right, so uh, in this scenario, um, under laissez-faire economics, we get uh, businesses being uh, able to increase profit and grow larger. If you can increase the amount of profit you make uh, producing and selling goods or trading goods, then you can take that extra money or profit that you have made and reinvest it back into your company to make sure that you are even more efficient and that your production is even more, um, uh, has a reduction in costs and so on. So therefore, you can eventually sell at even a lower price uh, and get even more business as a result. It, uh, this system also allows businesses to specialize in areas or products that you can profit from. Right. So the law of self-interest says you would do what's in your best um, interest to, uh, to, to benefit yourself. So a company would likely realize that if they produce three goods, um, and one good is far more profitable than the others, or they can produce them at a very, very low expense, then why would they share their production up amongst these three products when they can maybe shift and produce one product that they're really good at um, and therefore get a larger share of that trade, that production, uh, and be far more efficient as a whole by doing that. So you specialize in an area and you can profit more from that. Uh, these businesses can become major employers and be more responsible for hiring and firing of workers, working conditions, and so on. Um, so for people who argue that uh, government's job is to make sure that you know the unemployment rate is low, people have jobs, and so on, uh, people at the time supporting laissez-faire economics would say that, um, you know, the, that, that employers and businesses are now the people who um, are responsible for that. As these business, businesses grow, they will need to hire more people. And if restrictions, uh, government restrictions are reduced, then that means that uh, businesses will grow more. They will hire more people. You would have less unemployment. Uh, more people uh, in the workforce getting paid, spending money, and therefore fueling and keeping the system going and continually growing. So businesses can become major employers in this system. Uh, and also, finally, businesses can succeed or fail based on their competitiveness in the marketplace. So that idea of competition, can you be efficient? Can you sell at a lower price than your competitors? Can you produce goods that are noticeably better quality than other cheaper equivalents? Um, whatever, whatever angle results in more business and, and, and production and sales um, will allow, uh, allow a business to probably uh, succeed. Uh, and their competitors who can't do the job as good as they can will likely fail. So the idea was at the end of the day that government did not have to be as involved in the economy because business would take care of most of society's needs. And you can apply this to almost any area. If education, for example, is um, 
uh, a need that society has. One might argue that you can have businesses set up that provide the service of education, and they can create efficiencies within their business to provide teaching, uh, textbooks, materials, whatever might be needed, uh, at a cheap price that is still um, uh, competitive or, or has quality. Um, so that, that, you know, it can apply to service uh, providing as well as it can provide to or uh, apply to selling of products. Okay, we'll see more of this as we go on forward. The final point, uh, all of this would lead to what we now know as capitalism. Okay, and that's basically a system in which the factors of production, those things that you need in order to produce, things like land and uh, an area um, to use, labor, people to do the work, and capital, um, startup money, investment money, resources, uh, those things we call the factors of production. Capitalism is a system where the factors of production are privately owned not by government, but by individuals, uh, and money is invested into business activities for the purposes of making a profit. So that's key. So the profit incentive, or we do business and we sell things because we can make more and more money at it, uh, either because we want to be wealthier ourselves or because we can actually grow our business and down the road increase our potential uh, for um, uh, generating wealth. Whatever way you look at it, that profit incentive is what drives capitalism, which started with this idea of uh, laissez-faire economics, which was uh, a big contribution to uh, economics by Adam Smith and others who would support his ideas. Um, a Final point that I'll mention is that this system of capitalism where government stays out of business concerns would eventually be uh, widely adopted, especially by European countries. Uh, and it would allow uh, businesses uh, within countries to expand production at an unprecedented rate. Uh, and what we find, uh, what we will see happens at that point is We'll get um, uh, new technologies, uh, machinery, new processes, new learning um, that are developed and produced for the purposes of gaining greater efficiency in business. Uh, and at the end of the day, what that will, will result in is uh, what we call the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and that'll have one of the... Uh, largest and widespread effects on human society uh, in history. Um, and we still see the effects of, uh, of that today. And we still live very much under so, uh, those systems. Uh, so in 11.2, we will get into um, looking at uh, what the Industrial Revolution was. It's a link to capitalism. Uh, and we'll also get into uh, the some of the benefits and the challenges of industrialism.